Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank you for being brave enough to, to come sit uh, close to us as well. Some of you may have noticed I'm not Suzanne Beagle. I do my best every day, make my hair a little bit curlier, getting older by the year. Um, Suzanne and I have worked together um, over the last decade, actually, and it's really a, a pleasure to be uh, sitting in her shoes in many ways. Um, and she had some visa issues and was not able to join us. Um, but given that we're very close partners, was happy to be able to come in and, and support in the context of this panel and the conference more generally. So in a, a couple places in the conference where you see Suzanne's name, expect to, uh, to see me instead. And I hope I'll do half the job um, that she would do. As you know, she's um, a fabulous presenter in her own right. Um, so the topic of today, um, <coughs> impact networks, um, I think we're, we're happy to start there, but we really want to make sure that we get the opportunity to hear and learn from all of you and see what you're most interested in and really base our, our remarks on that and as much as possible really have a collaborative conversation. So we're going to be giving a bit of background. Um, I think really going from uh, from left to right here, that I'm co-founder and CEO of the Tonic Global Investor Network, then Nicholas Hutter, our European director, and Frank von Boinigen, who I've spent the last 20 minutes learning to pronounce that more or less correctly, <laughs> um, who's one of our partners um, in the Netherlands and um, I'd say founder, co-founder with his partner, Margaret, of Pim Wimmick, Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is Community, um, founded in 1994 that works with investors um, in the Netherlands and, and beyond. So in that order, we'll be able to talk about the mechanics of running a global impact investor network, a regional one and a more local one, all doing global work in terms of the companies we're supporting. That's sort of the background in terms of the um, what we'll be explaining in the structures that we run, but we do want to make sure that we're talking about things that are relevant to you. Um, so from that perspective, we did want to uh, take a moment before we jump in to get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, so how many people are entrepreneurs? You can raise your hands. Great. You know always when you do a panel of investing, it's the entrepreneurs that come out in full force. Um, and how many people are um, with intermediary organizations or looking to start an investor network that came to, to learn from that capacity? Great. 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 And I see there may be some overlap with the entrepreneurs, even better. Um, and how many people are investors that are, are seeking to uh, place impact? Margaret is cheating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's Frank's partner and one of the great forces behind Pimwimic's uh, community building as well. Um, and I'd love to get from the audience if we could get three or four questions of given all the incredible things happening at SOCAF today, you chose to take an hour to be with us. So we value that, that choice that you've made and want to make sure we fulfill those expectations. What are a couple key questions that you might have come into the room with that you hope that we're able to address? Hussein uh, Demir, hi. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one is, uh, how do you yeah, source your deals? And then the second question is, what are your transactional costs? Thank you. Can you please repeat the first question for me? <clears throat> so, how do you source your deals, okay, projects? Great. Yeah. Great. My name is Amir, and uh, my thoughts are... are, are Concerned about how you make your, um, uh, have you seen on your exit strategies and 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 uh, thoughts about that and how ar around these kind of investments? Sort of the elusive holy grail, do they exist? Yes. And I, I think we believe so. Um, a couple other, we have a question from the back here. Sorry to make you sprint. We'll try to group these. Wow! Big round of applause <laughs> for Bjorn. Very impressive. Um, my name's Mark Mullen. I, uh, I live in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, the, the country next to Chechnya, not the state next to Alabama. Um, and I tried to set up an angel uh, network there uh, a couple of years ago. I've lived there since 1997. Um, and we had investors and, uh, and we had a, a pretty reasonable deal flow, but um, a, a couple of different things happened. We had a difficulty explaining to entrepreneurs how to do a business plan and, and really what we needed was somebody to work full-time for us helping the the entrepreneurs um, with predictive cash flows and that uh, that sort of thing to simplify it for the investors um, and we never really figured out who to do that because we weren't a fund we were just a collection of individuals and who who would that person work for who would manage them 
um, that sort of thing. So that seemed to us to be crucial, that, that sort of, that person in between the investors and the entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering what success you've had in that or how, who, who should that person work for or, uh, or, or things around you that, talking about a, you know, a small country in a, in a mid-income country. Thanks. Right. And we'll definitely be talking about the different business models that we've all explored. Um, everyone recognizes these things need to be done. No one wants to pay for them, as most things in life. Hi, uh, <clears throat> my name is Jeff Bernard, and my question is about what relationship you have with financial regulators. Mm -hmm. As little as possible, but yes. Um, just some, sorry, Giles Davis, just some thoughts about angel um, networks and investing directly into single projects versus investing through intermediary funds. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Lars Prekeus. Uh, I have a question concerning uh, the differences, if there are any, between a, so to speak, a normal business angel network and one which is focusing on, on social ventures. We've been told we're more fun, but beyond that, there's you know, some other pieces, sure. My name is Wouter van Tongeren. Um, I have a question. Um, social capital, we're after both impact and uh, a return, at least. Um, how do you measure the impact? Do you have a certain impact appetite? Great. Let's take maybe one more. And if we're lucky, we'll answer at least half. Good afternoon. My name is Liz. I'm from Sydney in Australia. I'd be very interested to hear about the balance between the social return and the impact on people, indigenous people in particular, and the financial returns percentage Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, this is a good time as well. I'd love to make sure I know, in a, on a time check perspective, what time does this panel end? Because otherwise, I'll keep you here all day <coughs> answering all those great questions. Does anyone have that in front of them? 2.15. Okay, great. So I think our aspiration is that we're going to take no more than five to seven minutes each um, to make sure that we're really able to spend as much time as possible on the dis conversation between the participants. And we'll also make sure in the context of our presentations to try to hit on some of these points as much as possible. Um, yes. Amazing. Fabulous. We'll drone on for, for 15 minutes more then. Um, fabulous. Looking forward to it. Um, so I'm going to start in talking a bit about the mechanics of the global network that we've built. And then, as I mentioned, we'll drill down into regional, local, and how those different models um, interact over time. And I think that's in our experience with Tonic of really seeing the ways that we need to bring these together. Um, so I think as we've seen, there's incredible opportunity. I know that this stat has been mentioned many times. I'm sure will be used many times over the course of, of uh, this conference. And it's a massive opportunity. Um, it's 10 times as much as what goes through um, donations and DFIs globally, that this is really the latest trend in terms of uh, where all those economic development dollars are going to go. And as that ecosystem is growing to support it, we're seeing that there are incredible challenges. So someone had asked about transactions costs. And, and these are, are significant, um, that when we're looking at global deals that have complex legal structures and environments that are quite new, where there's a lack of co-investors locally to be able to support this sort of work or even others uh, locally within your, your ecosystem, finding quality deal flow. I think, um, as, as Mark had mentioned in Georgia, there's a lot of projects, um, but those doesn't necessarily mean that they're at the point of being investment deals, as Nicholas sometimes says of, you know, add money and stir, right? That this is more often looking at projects where we do need to put a lot of tender love and care into building them into investable enterprises. Who's going to take on that work? How do you make sure you don't erode your investment value by the time that you've finished all that preparatory work going into it? Um, community engagement and impact evaluation are two big spaces that I think the industry is working hard to build, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and that entrepreneurs in that context are lacking some of the support systems that they might need. And essentially the origin of Tonic, I'm from San Francisco, California, um, was that there were a number of Silicon Valley investors that uh, were hosting some living room gatherings. Of um, They were the ones that were crazy enough to be flying around the world and dealing with these transaction costs and trying to find the ways to be able to put this together. And this was over about four years ago that we'd done our first meeting um, and realized that we really had the opportunity in banding together to be able to lower those transaction costs significantly to be able to work on a global platform that would really ease the way that we could get money into this ecosystem. 
Um, so essentially what we've built over the last two years since we launched at SOCAP 2010 um, in San Francisco is now 39 investors across the US and Europe. It's about two thirds in the US, a third in Europe. We're hoping to get that neck and neck um, over the next couple of years. Um, that are collectively seeking to place 100 million into early stage enterprises and funds. So I think on that fund versus enterprise question, it's that we often do both, right? That you're able to get different insights through those different relationships and that we help members figure out what's most appropriate to them. Um, we've done 19 deals over the past 15 months. Um, I think that often in the context of um, investment networks out there, is often considered an impressive statistic, makes us one of the most active networks in the world. When you look at the US angel market in general, they did 23,000 deals last year. So 19, 23,000, we still have a ways to go as an industry. So I think this is a good start um, and that we can't rest on our laurels, need to continue to move things along. Um, our membership is quite diverse from individuals, family offices, family foundations as the three largest groups spanning the US and Europe. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, a bit a bit more quickly uh, through these pieces uh, with an incredible mix. And that's what we found with a growing network that we have um, a real range of financial interests of people who say, I'll, I'll do any sector geography and I just want my money back plus some to really looking for financial first opportunities. And we're able to match investors with the opportunities that are going to best um, hit their interests. And um, someone had mentioned the question around exits. We've started to, this is a very small <coughs> term terminology piece, but really talk more about return of capital, um, because we're not likely going to have the classic IPO um, or the acquisition of the coffee co-op in Kenya. In some cases, yes, that may be the more appropriate model, but we're starting to look at a lot of alternative deal structures of whether it's dividends or other means to ensure we at least get that return of capital plus some. Um, just a little bit more that it's really quite global, um, even though it's primarily US and European membership. Um, about 80% of the 300 deals that we looked at last year were in developing markets, uh, specifically focused on developing markets. Um, in terms of our membership requirements, that we really grew out of a desire to be an action-oriented community. Members commit to doing at least two deals a year, investing at least 50,000. And that means that we're really not, not for everyone, nor do we need to be. And I think one thing we've learned about running networks is, is how to not be everything to everyone. Um, and that we wanted to have that very specific focus. Our meetings are very much about transactions and about building relationships between investors globally to be able to facilitate that. And um, we also have a nonprofit Institute um, that helps to contribute to best practices globally and help other networks um, try to get off the ground. So we've been quite active with groups in India and Mexico and different parts of the world to help develop loca uh, local angel networks. Um, just a couple examples out of the 19 investments that we've done together. Um, so Sanergy, which some people may have heard of, it was actually uh, received some grant support from um, the Swedish development organization as well that does sanitation and energy in the slums of Kenya, essentially being able to collect um, the waste um, and convert that into energy that they can sell to the grid. And one of our members um, brought together 11 investors in a syndicate to invest half a million in the company. Um, and one of the things Tonic members are really, hopefully, thoughtful about is in scaling enterprises. This was a case where a member made a grant first to the company to be able to do a proof of concept. And then once they felt secure that this had, in fact, turned from a project to an investable deal, was able to bring that syndicate together. So we really try to do a life cycle analysis of what is this company going to need, what types of capital at different points in time, and bring those people around it. Um, then Lumni is another one um, that came out of Latin America um, and actually went from Colombia and Mexico to the US now that finances education based on future income. Um, I, wish, <laughs> I wish that all these uh, countries like Sweden had access to free education. In the absence of that, um, what you find is that low-income students um, who do not have collateral, it's very difficult for them to get financing to go to school. And in this way, they're able to pay 3 to 5% of their income for the 10 years after they graduate school on the assumption that if someone gets into the top medical school in Mexico, when they graduate, they're going to have a decent income. Um, so the company is already profitable in Latin America, and it's just getting its foothold in the US this year. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn over to my colleague, uh, Nicholas, who's the director um, in Europe. And he can talk a little bit more of the specifics of uh, what the dynamics of running an, a network in Europe look like.
Hi, thanks. Um, so Tonic Europe is uh, about the same age as Tonic Global. It grew um, in the last uh, 15 months to about 14 members now across five countries. And as you know, the uh, European Union and Europe is much more fragmented and inhomogeneous as the United States. So we are employing a bit of a different model. We're growing through partnerships, um, one in the UK and in the Netherlands. And uh, Pim Wimmick, uh, Frank and Margaret are our partners um, in Holland. And uh, Frank will talk a bit more about um, how this works, the partnership between a, a regionally very well-grounded network and the global network like Tonic. And uh, what we see with the growing membership around uh, in Europe is also that uh, um, with more members in Europe who also focus on bottom of the pyramid projects in developing markets, but also want to invest in uh, companies that are d addressing domestic issues either here in Europe or in the US. So um, the last two deals that were closed by European members were deals in the US and in here in Europe, a renewable energy company, for instance. And um, so we're here to connect in Scandinavia and uh, really get a feeling of how the impact investment space here is working to connect with the relevant players here. So please, after this panel, seek us out. Um, we put our business cards there and um, we'd love to connect with those people who are interested in moving the, the space forward here in Scandinavia. No, that's fine. So Frank, why don't we turn it over to you? Um, <coughs> would love to hear a bit more about the Pim Wimmick experience. Um, I'm gonna be talking, uh, I don't need a double microphone, that's <laughs> silly. Um, nor do I really need one at all, but um, essentially hearing more about how you've brought together this group of investors locally, that the growth of Pim Wimmick I, I know is um, the type of platform that a number of groups would like to be able to emulate in their local context, and then also in connecting in with Tonic, of then you've been able to connect the local and the global. Um, so we'd love to hear more of your story. Thank you. This is a long story, because we started in 1994, um, and we really started in, in mirroring what already in the States started in this Investor Circle. Investor Circle was the first community of, um, of investors in impact investing. The word impact investing wasn't invented then yet, it was social responsible companies. But it was the first um, circle coming out of SVN and uh, Social Venture Network. And that was a very great example how we should have, how we, we did it in that time. Um, and um, it is a membership organization. They uh, do the due diligence with the people who want to go deeper in a project. So that's the cost of the due diligence, there's a question of that. Um, and the membership organization, uh, Investor Circle, provides the companies. The companies come in, they search for the companies, and they present them on a special day, uh, two days in, in, in the year. We brought that exact copy of that uh, system we brought over to Holland. Um, and uh, we called it in that time, uh, Money Meets Ideas. And um, uh, it was great. But the authorities, and there was a question, in what, how do the authorities look to those things, was against it. They say, you're offering shares. You are not authorized to uh, advise. You're not authorized to offer shares. And we said, oh, we don't do that at all. We offer only a table and two chairs. Um, so we couldn't do that. And uh, we had to sell the concept of uh, money meter deals to a bank who um, had the authority rules or applied for authority rules. So there we were, we started again. And um, then we started a small little fund uh, with 30 shareholders and we did it with that. And but that was limited. We only invested in eight companies because the fund was very small and we wanted to do more. So slowly on, we started to be a um, transaction or a matching making firm. And um, so we could serve more companies and we could help many more people with capital. Today, um, we have around us a group of 350 informal investors um, and we know exactly what they want. 
a, a small group wants to go in water, thinks water issues is the most important thing in the world. Another group wants to go affordable housing, sustainable agriculture, healthcare, call it all. Wherever you meaning is, you want to invest in something. And when we have and when we have a company and we do the due diligence of the company, we give a stamp of approval per women approved, then we call the capital who wants to go, we know who wants to go in that particular company. And um, so a match is done. Um, and we're changing now how the economics of this group work, how this um, angel group works. In the beginning, the company paid as a success fee. Um, and now we're changing over to a um, membership organization because the 350 informal investors we have around us is a loose organization. They don't pay, pay membership and we're going to shift to a membership organization and shift over that if some one of the members invests that he or she pays a small little fee to cover our due diligence costs and our operation costs. So the membership will, uh, will cover that and the success fee. So we're shifting over to an, a new system and that new system is, in, um, is parallel to the thinking of the authorities. Because the authorities like to have a very clean and transparent system. And if the company pays for the, for the success fee, it's not transparent for the investor. So this is transparent and authorities like this, so we change this to be you know, in the rules. Now once, once the investors have done a couple of local investments, then they want to go outside. They want to go outside of the borders of the Netherlands, outside the borders of Benelux, outside the borders of Europe. And then they become member of Tonic. So this is the collaboration of the step up from learning curve to put your foot wet, to do it locally, internationally, and to Tonic. That's the curve. <laughs> that's that's a curve, but it's it's <laughs> a one that's worked out well for us. And I think you hear um, I think pretty strongly, and obviously this is going to be our bias as we run networks, um, but the power of collaboration, that when we look at a lot of these questions of how do you do effective deal sourcing, how do you address transaction costs, how do you look at exit strategies, that the more good minds you have around that question, and I think increasingly in the context of impact investment, you need those minds working globally. Um, so there's something great in um, Tonic sitting globally with collaborations in local um, impact networks around the world, if you need the best Indian lawyer to facilitate a transaction or the best uh, Brazilian tech guy to join your startup, you know, we're able to get access to those global relationships in a way that significantly reduces those costs. There's a lot of examples of people doing it on their own, but boy, do they work harder. <laughs> so I think that's what we found, the um, incredible power of collaboration through networks. And then as Frank has said, the evolution of what are the business models that are gonna be able to support that. Um, and I think we all run um, incredibly lean organizations um, in terms of the work that we do and that there's a lot of room for growth. But I also think it's encouraging for the sector that it really doesn't take that much, that with just a couple staff, you're able to really pull together 350 investors. And, and am I correct? Is it 34 Investments. So has been quite active as well in terms of bringing things together. Um, so that's that's just our opening remarks, and we really did want to reserve most of the time for conversation. We have some questions from the beginning that I know have not gotten fully touched, um, so feel free to come back to those themes. But I do want to start um, opening things up if there's questions, and then also if panelists have questions of each other, um, feel free to jump in there as well. Um, but can we start with someone from the audience? And I think, um, thank you so much, Bjorn. Feel free to walk. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm just curious about Tonic Europe. Um, question for Nicholas. 
uh, how many investments have been done in uh, just, um, I don't know, a year in Tonic Europe with your 14 members? And um, do you mind people who ask questions, your name uh, and where you're I'm coming from? Stefan Porte. I'm an uh, entrepreneur for Desmo. Yeah, actually, I have to pass this question to Morgan. This is my second month with Tonic Europe, and uh, I don't have the statistics at the pit point of my tip, fingertips. He's already a pro. Um, so I, I think w there's a couple different ways to answer that question. Um, so out of the 19 deals, I want to make sure I'm, I'm parsing the data in the right way. I'm gonna say that seven of those had participation from European members, um, and a number of those deals are global. As I mentioned, the last two deals, or as Nicholas mentioned, the last two deals, um, um, which are currently still raising, so I'm not gonna say the names, but just describe them. And these are the sorts of regulatory gymnastics that we do, um, but it's really, it's not that long of a list of do's and don'ts um, in terms of being able to pass regulatory muster, but this is one of them. Um, so one of them was a social networking uh, platform in the US, but that has the opportunity for global reach. That's about helping connect people to resources outside their um, individual networks. And then the other was a crowdfunded solar platform. Um, and in general, we found found strong interest from some of the European members that want to have access to early stage clean companies in the US, particularly around uh, clean tech and, and technology platforms specifically. Um, one of our members on the US side is Green Start, which brings in about 15 companies a year as investments, early stage clean tech companies that Kleiner Perkins and other VCs um, want to see grow, so sort of uh, pass them first to Green Start to incubate. There's been a number of opportunities that have come through there where you're Europeans who want to have a local partner uh, to do early stage clean tech can come in. So that there has actually been a strong emphasis on Europeans investing in the US. Um, and then there's also been a couple deals in Africa um, and in India. And I think I see um, a tonic member who I'm making eye contact with who if she wants to uh, speak about some of their portfolio is welcome to do so, but not to put you on the spot. So. Any tonic members are welcome to uh, chime in and thank you for those that are in the room. Do yeah, you want to add to that? Because I understood your question to be how many transactions have actually been to uh, tonic members investing into companies based in Europe, right? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, only one, the last one, uh, which presented yesterday. Um, but um, one of the issues that we also discussed yesterday, um, and I don't know whether you were still there at this impact investing forum, but uh, at, the, at the end there was a quite interesting discussion about uh, um, is there enough deal flow in Europe or is there not? And uh, Frank said yes and other people said uh, uh, no. And I think that really depends on whether you're prepared, and maybe that's uh, towards uh, Mark's question, whether you're prepared to do the capacity building, uh, roll your sleeves up and, and help the entrepreneurs. So up until now, I think... Um, um, our European members haven't seen the deal flow that they would want to see in Europe, um, but we're ramping that up um, because the maturity of the entrepreneurs on average in Europe is less than it would be in the US. And also if you look at uh, um, some of the prominent and advanced uh, companies that raise money in developing countries, very often they are um, have entrepreneurs that have been, either they are American and are quite advanced in, in knowing how um, uh, capital raising um, works or that, that have worked in the US. Um, so I think we're just uh, not as mature as this um, here in Europe and it needs more hand holding in order to bring a, a company to an investable stage. Yeah. And on that note, there is another company um, in the Netherlands that we're actively working with right now to get it to to investment ready stage. But I, I think we're, we're pretty committed uh, to that transaction happening. Margaret was going to uh, chime in there. Yeah, we can maybe have a couple mics running. <laughs> I have to run back. Um, I think that what we see at Pinwimic is that um, we have a number of really wonderful uh, partners who are um, funded from the lottery who have helped incubate um, social enterprises. We actually see different deal flow because some of the companies that come to us don't consider themselves social. They consider themselves good companies. And... and and don't have a separation between kind of social first and, and finance. They're more blended. So I think that's some of why we have, we have experienced different deal flow. And um, we have some pretty, yeah, pretty healthy companies that we also now, with this partnership, can hope to feed up into uh, a wider global 
channel to, to move more of that money. But of our, the 34 investments that we've done, I would say at least, at least half of them and maybe more, at least 50% are in Europe. Frank, do you want to add to that? Yes, 50% um, are in Europe because the, 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 the early investments were all in the United States. When we started in um, 1994, there were no companies in Europe who answered to the criteria we were looking for. Social responsible and making money. Um, so we had to find a, a, to the United States where it all came from. Um, so our first bulk of investments was in the States, quite successfully though. And then I'll note later. anyone, sorry to interrupt, anyone in the audience who's ever enjoyed a pint, uh, enjoyed a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream in Europe has this man to thank um, <laughs> for uh, getting the yeah. agreement together to bring them to Europe. Right. So thank right. you for that. Right. Oh, thank you. Well, we liked it too. Uh, um, so, um, but later on, now slowly on in Europe, 10 years ago, social entrepreneurs started here social entrepreneurs who had a great social product and investable and a pro possible, uh, possible outlook for um, uh, financial positive returns. So only 10 years is the, uh, is the past time that we are investing in Europe. I think we had another question. Maybe we can get the other microphone. Oh, I guess. Okay, great. This is on. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Ross Baird. I run an organization called Village Capital that um, we have about 20 seed stage investments across the world. Um, friends, I'll just talk loud. No, no, we need it for the recording, oh. but give it a try. Okay. Uh, we're very big fans and close friends with both Pim Wimmick and Tonic, and we've had uh, companies get, get funded through these networks. Um, I just wanted to ask a question based off of dynamics I've been seeing with entrepreneurs and angel networks because most of my experience with angel networks even though I used to work for a tonic member and was on the investor side is actually trying to get entrepreneurs through angel networks closing rounds and we've had great experience with entrepreneurs and angel networks and we've had some pretty frustrating experiences and the biggest differentiator is uh, if there is a member inside the network who jumps on and says this deal needs to happen. And it requires the member, you know, making calls and twisting arms and cajoling and saying, you know, we need an, another 100,000, do me a favor and I'll, I'll do you a solid next time. Like that's, that's, that's the network at its best and we've seen that work. Um, what happens often is on the flip side, an entrepreneur maybe has two or three investors who are interested and then they'll have a call and one of the members will come in and say some comment that just kills all enthusiasm from everyone. There's a kind of veto player, like if someone speaks out publicly, like I don't particularly like this deal. There are two other people that the that the entrepreneur had been having conversations with who are, you know, no longer interested. So there's, um, I don't know, there's there's a plus and a minus of the group dynamics between investors that seems confusing and opaque to the entrepreneurs that I work with at least. So I guess, I guess the question is, um, how do you think through managing investor group entrepreneur relations to maximize the good experiences and minimize the, the bad experiences? Maybe I'll start on that one. That's something we've been really thoughtful about from the beginning in setting up Tonic, and I'm not going to say that we have mastered it by any stretch of the imagination. And I think it's based on an overall um, ethos that I'd say we all share of um, the impact industry has this great opportunity to really put entrepreneurs and investors on a level playing field. That I think in, in traditional Silicon Valley, if I am the tech expert and I'm working with an entrepreneur that's coming pretty green into the field, I can make a viable claim to being the expert in X field, whereas in the context of being an impact investor, all of a sudden I'm expected to be the expert on health, education, water, right? all these different fields, so many different geographies 
in this context, we have to have a lot of faith in the entrepreneurs to really be our partners in building this, and that it's one thing to have the capital, but that's not the same as having the brain power behind it. So we try to really think through as a guiding principle in our processes, if I ask for an hour of an entrepreneur's time, how do I at least, how do I give that hour back, right, in, in whatever it is that they need to do for me? So that can be as simple as if they're going to do a diligence call, do I make sure that I'm giving feedback to that entrepreneur consistently, even if they're not going to get funded? Um, also, I think the common dynamic with investors are angel networks. It's that the best answer is a yes, the second best is a no, and the worst is a maybe. Um, and that we really try to be uh, is communicate as clearly and quickly as possible if we feel that we're not going to get traction. When someone applies to Tonic, they get an email about this long explaining exactly who's going to be looking at their deal, how it's going to get promoted, when they're going to hear from us, you know, so that we're trying to be as clear as possible. And a lot of folks that actually advised us in the beginning, don't do that. <laughs> you know, if you tell people what the process is and they're just going to ask you more questions and you're going to get overburdened by entrepreneurs, and what we found was overwhelmingly we got the feedback of, wow, now I know. <laughs> you know, thank you. This is fine. Um, I think there's still some pieces that we need to do better. Um, a fourth of our deals actually um, came into the network or the deals that got funded um, did not have a champion when they entered the network. It was that we were able to uh, determine through our relationships who was going to be the best person and have them really take up the charge. You do need to have someone excited about your deal. And I do think there's sometimes the expectation on the entrepreneur side, they are so committed to what they're doing, someone else must think this is the most important thing in the world. And hopefully that person's out there. They might not be part of my 39 people, right? So sometimes you do have to take that risk. Not every deal, you know, we did 19 out of 300 deals that's a pretty decent ratio. It means I'm going to disappoint those 281, but at least I can provide them with some useful feedback and some connections to help them move forward. Um, so I think that's how we tend to look at those. I would love to hear other thoughts on those questions. I, I totally agree. If the panel is called uh, How to Make It Work, uh, and I think uh, finding that uh, champion for the deal is, is the, the biggest key in order to make it successful and also a pleasurable and fun experience. So I think a lot is also in the framing of uh, when you, you know, like entrepreneurs come and either upload uh, their information onto our platform and we distribute it and, and uh, draw attention to it among our members or they present in our global call, but the presentation is really just a sneak preview of 10 minutes, five minute Q&A. And then those who are interested can come into a longer call uh, and a longer presentation a, a day or two later. Um, so I think, when you say, rather than try and get interest for people to sign up, try and to find that champion. That's your first sort of entry point. Um, and when that happens, then then things work. And you s as you said, like those people take leadership. And uh, this also ties in with the regulatory question. Um, we can't promote a deal. Yeah? Somebody needs to pick that up. So we can't push on a string. Somebody needs to stand up there, take up the string, and then start pulling. And then we can help to pull and and make the um, gain momentum, make the process gain momentum, and and make it actually work, rather than you know everybody standing there and waiting for somebody to pick up the line and start pushing pulling. Yeah. And one thing just to add on that before we pass to Frank, I think in the dynamic of successful networks as well has to be the expectation that investors are really taking the lead on doing the work. So I think there's no other way that we would have been able to facilitate 19 investments with essentially two and three quarters staff, right? That the, the um, responsibility really has to be collective. And there's five of us that are co-founders of Tonic and additional 10 investors that signed on as founding partners that we really made sure from the start that it was a community effort. And I think that's another piece in starting a new network of how you make sure you have a strong community that everyone expects to be putting in the time and work that it takes to do successful investments. Um, Frank, your well, thoughts? There, there is a big difference between Tonic and Pimwimic. Um, as uh, Nicholas said, um, some of the uh, members have to stand up and, and, and take it over and pull it um, and um, organize a group of, uh, of other members to do together the due diligence. We do different. Um, the companies come to Pimwimic. We get about 100, 100 companies a year you know, solicitating, you know, do you have money for us? Um, and we, we select immediately from that about 10 companies. And with 10 companies, we, we, we search further. We do the due diligence. Pimwimic does the due diligence. 
Um, and when we think, hey, this is all right, when we give a stamp of approval, then we look for capital. Then we kind of push it. But we kind of sure already then, when we have put a stamp of approval, then we, then we can give them money. Because we know our circle of capital. We know that in that company, you know, out of the 350, there are 20 people who want to, wants to invest in it. So it is a kind of a difference in, in approach and difference in, in thinking. What you're talking about is a peer-to-peer -peer sharing. That's also an important distinction regulatory-wise, is that we're talking to accredited investors so that when we say we believe in this, they also know that it's still, it's always risk capital. It's a very high risk business, this business. So, um, and they're the kind of people that have testified basically that they can take this risk. Because otherwise then you're talking about, we, we still encourage all of those investors to also see their own lawyer, see their own tax attorneys. You know, we are not a bank that says, um, you know, this is a guaranteed product. But, but it is about trust, Ross. And so you, but the trust part process is a really important part of the network, certainly of our network. So once we say that, we, you know, this one is worth risk, then people trust us enough to come and look at it. Thank you. That's very true because there's a very fine line between what we say, hey, this is okay, does not mean this is a, this is a winner. Um, so that's the very fine line. Um, I'm looking at where the microphone is and how we get it closest to the, uh, maybe keep both moving around, um, to the woman in the uh, sweater right there. Hi, I'm Lam Nguyen from um, Vietnam. Um, I, I think somebody had mentioned about emerging market. And uh, what I'd like to know is what are the criteria as well as how do you measure impact in that case? Can you clarify, do you mean criteria for emerging markets? Or? For investment in, in a social entrepreneur that, that is in an emerging market. Gotcha, general criteria. Um, so that, that varies a lot from investor to investor, and I think that's part of the challenge, uh, the challenge and the opportunity of a nascent industry, and I actually do think it's good that people are at a phase of being very open-minded um, about what that can mean and really needing to harness the wisdom, um, both of entrepreneurs and then I think um, the often least talked about community, because even in something like SOCAP, they're not in the room, is, is the beneficiaries. Um, and that connects back to impact measurement. We can pick any number of whether we're looking for more you know, clean water or electricity or whatnot. The end of the day question of, um, did we help the people we intended to help? <laughs> you know, did they get to be part of the conversation about what are the products, services that are most helpful for their communities of what sort of assets they're looking to build? And that's one of the things I'm hopeful you know, for future events like SOCAP of um, it's great that there's opportunities, investors and uh, scholarships for entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, let's make sure that communities are part of that conversation so that when we as investors are looking at where do we get the most impact, it's, it's who, who is informing those decisions, right? That we can't just make those, that conversation can't just be accredited investor to accredited investor. Um, so I think that's, it's evolving. Um, in terms of what sort of impact people are looking for. Um, and then in terms of impact measurement, there's a number of tools that have sort of been growing and becoming more in vogue globally. In the context of Tonic, we've done a bit of a mishmash um, between the Gears analytics system, which I believe is doing a demo later on today. Um, it's a great opportunity, I think, globally for us to be building up um, a collectible source of global data about social enterprises, of being able to rank them against each other and get a broader sense of what's happening. Um, the IRIS taxonomy, which is essentially a library of terms. Um, it can be tricky if I'm saying, you know, this water project had a thousand beneficiaries. Well, was that that they came once in a day or multiple times in a day? You know, that you need to be pretty specific on what those terms mean to make sure you're able to compare across enterprises. So the IRIS taxonomy has been a useful tool for that. The final piece is that um, 
um, we make sure to reserve a lot of space for indicators that are reported by that beneficiary community, by the entrepreneur. Um, because some of the impacts, you can't sort of go with your measurement tool and in that same way have the presumption that you know what's most impactful for that particular community. So uh, to give an example of that, there's a company uh, that we've invested in, or rather Tonic members have invested in, called Liberty and Justice, based in Liberia, that's a fair trade clothing factory. Um, I, I believe Chid Liberty has spoken at, at these forums in the past. One of the really interesting impact indicators that you wouldn't quite think about from the start of the 25 women that were working at the company for the first in the first six months, six of them got divorces. Um, and it was that often in the context of Liberia, these were women that had been married off at the age of 12, had no choice in terms of who they were marrying, and the moment that they had some financial independence to be able to send their children to school, to be able to live independently, that was the first choice that they made for themselves. Now, I don't think in the context of a social enterprise, you would typically think to have classes after the factory day of how to go get divorced or how to change your name, right? Um, but if you look at indicators of economic empowerment, this was something that was very important to these women. Um, and I think it's that as investors, we need to really be open-minded um, about what are the benefits that people are really looking for and what are the appropriate indicators. And yes, that means that it's not always going to be comparable across enterprises and, you know, too bad, right? And that's where you do need to have some customized approaches to communities. Um, curious about how Pim Wimmick looks at measuring impact. Well, especially in emerging markets, uh, to answer that question, um, most of it immediately is an um, employment. Um, and uh, the biggest impact investor uh, in emerging markets is microfinance, combat uh, com against poverty. Um, and what is even better, investing in SMEs. Because not, not everybody is entrepreneur. Not everybody can start with a microfinance loan. So SMEs, uh, if you invest in SMEs, they employ people who are not uh, entrepreneurs or might be not entrepreneurs. So this employment <coughs> possibility for SMEs is much bigger than even uh, microfinance. So there is the biggest measurement tool in in uh, employment. Um, and um, uh, we um, have invested in, in a small fund um, in Eastern Africa. And um, and there, uh, the the manage management um, fee or the management um, extra bonus, what they get, um, is is uh, is calculated or they get punished if they don't achieve the the, the measurement rules of the social impact, and it's very very good. And I think that's something that investors are more and more looking for um, as a criteria. Anything you wanted to add, Nicholas? Um, I think the question from the front in the green sweater. I'm um, Caroline Sedelov from Social Initiative. I'm uh, curious to learn more about uh, the uh, investments that you've done in uh, poor countries. Uh, both in terms of uh, the share of uh, the investments that you have done, but also in terms of the sourcing. Uh, do you see a lot coming there? And also, from the investor's point of view, is there uh, how big is the interest for making investments in uh, uh, social entrepreneurs in poor countries? Um, for Tonic in particular, very high. So about 80% of our work is um, looking at deals in developing countries. Um, about that percentage of our deals has been conducted in developing countries. A lot of the actual corporate entities that we're investing in might still be US or European, but that the work of the company is conducted through a subsidiary or otherwise. Um, and that helps to also conquer some of the issues. These are usually dollar denominated investments, regardless of the country, and sometimes they're might be a layer of currency insurance or you know, finding ways to, to deal with the Forex challenges that come along with it. Um, in terms of deal sourcing, we've put a large emphasis in Tonic on two pieces. So one is the members themselves. About a third of our deal flow comes from members um, coming and saying, and I, I think this is one of the main value that, that members get from the network, it's not just, here's this uh, great company in Brazil, it's we just finished Village Capital and of 
all these companies that presented, you know, I just spent three months with so-and-so and they're really terrific and we've put our money in and, um, you know, who, who wants to come along with us, right? So it's qualified deal flow from investors that people have the opportunity to build relationships with and sort of get a sense over time of, oh, if so-and-so is interested in a deal, it's likely a good one for me. Um, and our members travel so much that we literally have a member on every continent any day of the week. Um, so then we're able to capture a lot of their local relationships. The second third of our deal flow is through uh, deal flow partnerships that we've established. So we have a network of both local investors and local organizations um, that are in, I think at this point, uh, about 15 countries, um, some of the largest markets for impact investment globally. Um, so we do quarterly check-ins with them, at least uh, some quite more often than that, and are able to ensure that we're getting a good sense of what investors are working on locally. Um, and find that that piece is, is really essential as much as possible, like to have a local investor involved in a deal when it's in a, a developing country. Um, so, and then the last piece of your question, I think interest level is quite high. Um, and that a lot of the talent you know, has been looking um, in some of the poorest countries in the world. It's also interesting to note that um, the largest concentration of poor people nowadays actually live in middle income countries, right? So the Indias and the Brazils of the world. And one of the pieces um, that I'll note on the job creation side, we certainly look at job creation. I think we try to, as much as possible, think about job creation that's on ramps through education and asset building, um, that some of the sort of trickle down theories of uh, let's create jobs and hope that creates an um, equitable economy. It didn't work so well for the US, <laughs> right? And are not looking to, to replicate the, those structures. So can we find a way that is job creation that's really going to encourage a more equitable economy um, in a longer term way? And that's in you know looking at self solidarity economy models and other ways that we can, can contribute to that conversation. Um, I'm going to leave some space for my colleagues to comment as well. I'm yeah. sorry. I will uh, take the back seat for the next question. I'll, I'll, I'll sure, it's just because we're, uh, we're doing the live uh, web recording. I see. Um, a question about angel investors. I um, I get the impression that there are people who are impassioned defenders of debt and others who are impassioned defenders of equity. Um, have you got any thoughts on, well, in particular in the sort of deals you do, uh, the blend between the two and the pros and cons and challenges, et cetera? I'll take this yeah. one. Um, so I think it depends on two things. One is obviously the risk level of the of the company and the risk appetite of the investor. And uh, the other one are exit considerations. So even if you uh, would not invest uh, from a risk perspective through a debt instrument, um, maybe sometimes you have to because uh, you will stay marooned as an equity investor in that company forever. Um, so even if you invest equity and then you have a sort of uh, payback or recapitalization or dividend policy, it comes down effectively to a debt instrument. So I think um, it depends. Yeah? And um, for me, impact investing and social enterprise in particular is setting out to do one thing, which is sort of breaking down the, the silo barriers between uh, different um, uh, sectors that we have now. And um, we all have to collaborate. A lot of uh, social enterprise doesn't work without support from uh, philanthropy, either to ramp it up now or um, because uh, um, philanthropic investors or the public are actually the customer for um, paying for the beneficiaries and you have sort of tripod business models. Um, and um, so I think we have to think about um, business model engineering on that side and the the flip side of that within the company is the financial engineering and really breaking down the barriers between uh, the different instruments grants uh, debt and equity and taking those elements from these different instruments and making them work for uh, to deploy capital in a more effective and and efficient way and uh, Morgan was talking about various uh, new capital structures that may help to solve these exit issues such as revenue sharing, for instance, or factoring and things like that, which uh, will help uh, to overcome some of the different difficulties that we have at the moment, for instance, with investing plain equity and then not getting the money back. Because if the money is not coming back, um, we will have a sort of a, a bump of impact investing now and then we, it will die down. 
And I'll just add to that, we have um, a couple law professors at the University of Michigan who are doing a project for us next semester on alternative uh, deal structure uh, term sheets. Um, so we should be able to put out some good resources soon on investors that want to look at different models for returns of where they can go for that. In practice, you would see in developing countries most always debt. Uh, because they don't have the companies don't have a structure, and uh, the families who own the company don't like to give away their company, so debt financing is very much most most used. But debt financing with a, as we call it, a royalty. So if the if the um, company does well, um, then you get a, r a better return back than you six percent you are agreed upon. So, in investor parlance, you will have structural, you will have investment in a debt structure, yeah, but with a risk profile of equity and the return profile of equity. So there is a kicker element, and also, uh, if things go wrong, you it's uncollateralized and you will lose your money. So that would be the blend that most likely will happen and is is happening. Yeah. Are there other structures? Any investors from the audience where you've had particular success with one instrument or another? It's just because they're recording. I think the um, the royalty model is uh, is a uh, and it's a kind of a hybrid between, as you say, um, between equity sort of principles and, and and debt. But I think it's a really good good way forward in my experience. Other questions from the audience? And quickly before the next question, we've added some information about how to get in touch with Pinwemic. So I'll take notes. Yeah, and I think the next slide Thank you. here too. <laughs> Yeah, my question also dealt with uh, the debt and equity. Um, um, we haven't discussed the profitability of the investments yet. So what is the return you're after, and uh, are there any success stories of successful exits? If I say a beautiful success story, I have to say as well a, a negative story. Uh, so let me start, first start with a beautiful story. Um, we invested in a company called Plant Healthcare, um, and they um, uh, make a, 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 a natural fungus, what you introduce to the root of a plant, and it can be any crop or any anything, um, any plant or a grass root or a big tree, um, and the crop uh, is resistant, or the, the 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 roots are growing faster, the the. Um, the little plant get more nutrition out of the soil and is resistant all about what happens above the soil. So you don't have to spray it anymore and uh, it grows faster. You have a higher yield. Um, and this company went uh, it's great, it went really well and it went to the stock market. So we had an exit on the stock market. Um, so that was a really, really good uh, uh, exit and uh, a fantastic company. Now, a, a bad story to co to compare to make the balance um, is, um, and we came in love with this co company because it had it is biodegradable plastic. It was the first company in biodegradable plastic, and we said, "Wow, that is great! Biodegradable plastic that will conquer the world. Everybody's waiting for it." And um, so we invested heavily in it, and uh, but unfortunately. Our love for the product was too wild. <laughs> we didn't enough search in the in the in uh, if the technology was fully developed. And um, you can imagine when a bag, when a big bag of uh, of uh, dirt is in that bag, and uh, you want to put it on the street, and they pull it up, and the bottom goes out because it's already biodegraded. And um, so uh, people didn't like it so much. <laughs> uh, um, so, but but now you have to see now you have to uh, nowadays um, everywhere you see biodegradable uh, plastics. It is it it caught on. So this company was a forerunner, and our investments went foul. But the seed of the company, the idea of the company, the technology was taken over by somebody else.
So our investment became a grant to the technology of this world. And that's you have to see. Some pretty good reframing. Yeah. You want to add to that? Uh, no, just a general observation that when a window of opportunity opens, is not so, uh, very often it's not the first one who jumps through who gets it right, but the one who lands on its feet. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so I'm wanting, I, I actually think we did a decent job in getting through some of the questions from the beginning. There were two that I wanted to acknowledge uh, to make sure that we addressed, and then we'll take one more from the audience and then some framing comments. Um, so one was about um, investments in indigenous people and how how that's been part of the, the conversation. Um, and then businesses versus social angels. Um, so I might take that first one because there's uh, some investments within Tonic I can talk about. And then I don't know if you have any experience investing in companies connected to indigenous peoples to, no. to share. Um, and then businesses versus social angels would be great if one of you could take on. Um, so I, investments... Um, Connected to indigenous people, I think this is part of um, an important conversation that's been happening in the industry about ownership of social enterprises, that traditionally the model that we've seen a lot in the US is that um, very bright Stanford, MIT students go down to Kenya or whatever country and, and sort of poof, you know, bring in their solution. Um, and it might be a great product or service that's being sold, um, but particularly in the context of some rather expensive innovations, the family winds up in debt the entrepreneur might wind up decently well off and hopefully the investors make a killing. How do you make sure to balance out the benefits between investors, entrepreneurs, and communities and make sure they're really a, a key piece of that as well? And then finally, connecting back to making sure it's actually innovations that people want. Um, so a prime example of, of this, um, an organization that was supported by one of our members uh, called Grupo Yansa in the south of Mexico, um, which is an area that's very prime for wind energy. Um, and and essentially, major corporations were coming in and buying up, uh, through faulty contracts, indigenous land, so that you started to see major protests and wind blocks of wind energy. And this is the last thing you would expect to see, right? Large indigenous groups going down with wind energy, the enemy. Um, and some of the, the groups recognized um, that wind energy wasn't the problem. The problem was corporate control of their land, that this wasn't something that impact investors wanted to be promoting. Um, and essentially, the head of the Global Wind Commission, who started Grupo Yansa, uh, came together with these communities to work on founding an indigenous-owned wind company, um, and the idea that then investors can support solutions that are really going to grow community assets, create a community foundation. There's a couple models like that globally that I think have done a good job of growing assets within indigenous communities um, and being able to exploit natural resources on their own terms. Um, so I think in general, we're interested in, in projects that are really promoting local ownership um, in that sort of capacity. Um, so then the question on uh, working with business for social angels. Uh, Frank, I don't know if that's something in, in growing Pim Wimmick. I know you've seen lots of responses from people on different sides of that table. Social angels, we only work with social angels. Sure. They're all social angels. Um, but the question was, what's the difference between social angels and, and non-social angels? Um, and I think groups are, uh, non-social angels are more, are tend to be more groups of man. Private equity is almost a man environment. Not, on the, not on the LP level. Most fund of funds are... Uh, run by women. Is that so? Well, not most funds, but there's a, there's a disproportionate number of fund of fund managers. So actually, the the overlords of the private equity industry are there's lots of women in that industry. Which I, I think will is corroborate nice. with I, I Frank was, I was, for the impact. Then, then my theory is 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 run over. So uh, I stop. <laughs> <laughs> as as uh, the female representative here, I will corroborate your your story. So the the uh, and what you see is shift. In, in social responsibility and so impact, impact investing, there are so many more women there because it is part of gut feeling as well. It's not only done with your head, not only numbers, it's also what kind of good do I do in the world? And that's gut feeling, and that's, that's a good feeling, and that's the, 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 the what you want. And therefore, you see so many women as well now moving in this industry of impact investing. Um, 
and 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 the group of investors, the social investors we have around us, are are a mixed bag of women and and men, and therefore it is fun. It's not a, a drive to maximum financial profit. There's a drive to do good as well, and and that drive is is mainly, you know, driving up the, uh, on the on the surface. So Frank, now I understand. Impact investors are more fun because there's more women. Yeah, I, pre well, I appreciate not that. Not only theory. that, but uh, I mean, it, it is it is very big. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nicholas, having come from more conventional venture capital worlds and now moving into the impact investor world, I'm curious if you're seeing some differences in how um, more uh, conventional business-minded investors run their processes versus impact investors. I think, it, it again, it depends a bit on where you are. So if you are in places which are largely run by or, or characterized by the American culture, um, and also the conceptual clarity that uh, this brings. And I've seen that in India and in particular in the US, of course, and, and also in North uh, Western Europe. Um, I would say that there is a, um, a distinction, and but the, the worlds are more coalescing, as you said, like lo lots of tonic members have been entrepreneurs or VCs or business angel investors themselves, and they're now increasingly um, putting the meaning into their money affairs as well. Um, and coming back maybe to your question as well, um, that I think here in Europe, um, both the impact investing, the social angel space, and the social enterprise space is characterized by social angels and social entrepreneurs who don't see themselves as such. They just do what they do and th mm. do what feels right, but uh, um, they don't necessarily put that label upon themselves, also because these terms are not so clearly defined. Um, and um, I think, um, so the, if you, if you would say who's doing social investments in Austria, for instance, none of those people would say I'm an impact investor when you ask them what do you do. Yeah. So I think um, it's at because the market is so nascent at the moment, it's difficult to make that distinction. You really have to see what what is under the under the label, what people actually do. So can we take one last question from the audience and then we'll do closing remarks? Well, I have the mic, so I'm supposed to have the last question. Uh, in regards with that, uh, I think the many investors um, uh, are interested, uh, but not uh, uh, so the well informed about the structure of these social ventures. Uh, how much does your networks help with the structuring the deal or is it uh, hands off uh, when it comes to to the deal as a structure, and it's uh, uh, yeah, that's so that's my question. Sure. So in the case of tonic, it varies widely, um, just because there's investors that have greater levels of ex greater and lesser levels of experience in terms of being able to jump in and lead a deal. I think the other thing that we've learned um, through our last couple of years is that. Also, some common practices in impact investment doesn't mean they're best practices, right? So there's also a role that we can play in educating investors on what might be new structures or opportunities that they're able to, to bring into their work and that we have sort of a privileged position in watching the transactions of 40 different investors of getting a, a really strong library of potential term sheets and ways to put deals together. Um, there's times where we might have multiple investors working across borders where we'll be much more engaged in, in setting terms and sort of running the conversations. And it really just is about working with that lead investor, figuring out what level of support they're going to need um, and being able to, to provide that. So there's some elements we sometimes say it's like advanced secretarial, um, essentially, to some that's more really specific and in getting into those deal terms. Um, Frank, do you want to mention in the PIM Wimic context? Yes. Um, we we um, uh, educate the investors, we help the investors, and but we also help the entrepreneur. And I think that was your question. Um, and we guide entrepreneurs through all their difficulties and 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 problems they have. Um, we do the capacity building there, uh, and that we do as Pimimic. But if we have in our group of investors somebody who's really expert in that particular field of that particular company, then we ask him or her to do it in our place. So we really... No. 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 They'd have to give us a lot more money for that. 
<laughs> um, the one, just to, to give a concrete example of that, and I think it's important what Frank mentioned about, it's not just about us supporting the investors, it's supporting the entrepreneur. I had a deal closed last week where the amount went from 250 to 10,000 <laughs> back to 250 based on an entrepreneur, just who, great entrepreneur, just doesn't have experience with financing structures, didn't understand. Um, a certain term that was being asked of him and I sort of got the sense that his response was based on that misunderstanding and was able to give him a call as the intermediary and say, hey, just, just want to clarify you understand what this anti-dilution clause is actually asking you for. And when I explained it, he was like, oh, th of course, <laughs> you know, not, not a problem at all. Um, but that sometimes it takes the involvement of the intermediary who has the trusting relationships on both sides of that interaction um, to be able to drive a deal forward in a way that's, that's quite difficult and that I think we see ourselves as not sitting on the investor's side of the table or the entrepreneur's side. It's that we really need to support both parties in that transaction. And that's part of why Tonic, um, it's entirely membership fee-based. We don't take a cut of deals. And it's that we don't want to be biased towards, obviously we want investments to happen. We want the right investments to happen when it's the right time, right? So that we don't want to push a transaction if the terms aren't right or you know if something is not working for, for our members. Any addition to that? Great. We'll want to give um, each panelist a minute of just any final comments, observations that you want to share, advice for our lovely audience. Thank you all um, for all your contributions and a really interesting conversation. Um, Frank? Yeah, I'd like to share for those in the room who are investors or would like to be social uh, an impact investor, just start. Just make your feet wet. Just do it. Small and then do it again if it works well. And slowly you come into this field. And slowly you become member of one of the um, investor clubs. Because I also do capacity building for social entrepreneurs, I'll do the flip side and give some uh, piece of advice to the entrepreneurs here. Um, ask for advice from investors, don't ask for money, and then usually the money will come. Um, investments happen on the basis of relationships, so you have to build that relationship first. And uh, usually w working together on a problem, like working something out and asking for a piece of advice for your company, is a good way to build a relationship and to um, show what you do, how you think um, in a non-sales situation. Because if you drive somebody in a sales situation, like here, buy shares in my company, yeah, um, people go in a, in a defensive mode very often and you want them to listen and that may be a good framing to do that. And also, um, I think and that goes to both investors and um, uh, entrepreneurs in particular here in Europe. I think, um, as I said many times in this, in this panel, we're facing a situation where a lot of the companies are early stage, not so, um, and uh, where there's also limited uh, clarity about where a company is and there's therefore also a big uh, potential for misunderstanding and uh, uh, different expectations on the entrepreneur and on the investor side. And very often I've found that um, rather than asking, can you invest or would you invest into my company, to ask how, what, what, what needs to be true, how would you invest into my company um, in order to get um, an a feeling of uh, what a particular investor would want to see um, before they can invest um, and not just assuming that they can invest now so that you can see where maybe your concept in terms of maturity or in terms of proof of concept um, is still lacking the traction or whatever that investor may be looking for. Yeah. Um, and I think I would combine the two things that were just said in the um, just do it philosophy. I think that we found that the best way to form relationships between investors, investors and entrepreneurs is really in the process of doing deals and that there can be a lot of time put into the educational process of how do we get comfortable with this evolving field. And I think it's we're never going to get to a point or maybe it's five years from now and sort of, okay, impact investment is this one thing. It's going to be what we make of it. Um, and I think it's in the process of doing the deals that we're figuring that out. You know, that's when we're coming 
up with the most innovative structures. That's when we're finding the right ways to support entrepreneurs in their processes. And it takes really having that willingness um, that it may be that that first um, investment you make is that you're paying for your learning experience, um, that that's what it takes uh, to really get a better sense of, of how the market's going to grow. Um, so thank you all so much for taking this time with us. We hope and we'll continue to, to be in touch in various ways um, and enjoy the rest of your SOCAP experience. And get a round of applause for our lovely panelists. Thank you. <laughs>